the Radio Forest Podcast. Hey, this is Derek Stroop calling in. Stroop, what's happening, buddy? Hey, what's going on, man? How you doing? Good. Eating Dinner Twice is out now. How long did it take you to come up with this set? So how much did you have to prepare, I guess, is my question. I mean, it took a, it took a while, you know? I mean, this is, the first, this is my debut album, which I think anybody's debut album has got to be one that you you should especially listen to because it's usually going to be more years under the belt before that album comes out, you know, because the albums after that, you start rolling yearly, every year and a half, 18 months. But your first debut album, you usually make after being in the game for seven to 10 years. So it's got some of my favorite bits uh, compiled into into one 50-minute uh, listen. So I'm excited about it. Yeah, they say that about bands, rock bands. I mean, this is a classic rock station. So they say you have your whole life to make your first album. And then you've got like, you know, 18 months, two years to do your second. So the first one's kind of got some more depth. And I guess the same would go for comedy. You know, I didn't even I didn't even know that. But yeah, that's exactly that makes perfect sense with music the same way with comedy. You know, some of your your classics, if you will, are going to be in your first time around some bits you do a long time uh, that you've been cutting your teeth on out on the road. You put it down uh, on that on that debut album. And it's, and it's pretty special, especially teaming up with Larry the Cable Guy, Get Her Done label i mean on his label that's really a treat just makes perfect sense that we teamed up together with uh with our style of comedy so it, it's all it's all really fun how's larry's crowds it seems like i mean obviously he's massive does these huge stadiums sets records and it seems like nobody hates him what's the vibe like at a larry the cable guy show well as a southern comedian he has the most redneck crowd which is fun which I love. I mean, it's right down his alley. I mean, they're just good blue collar country folks. I mean, with my type of material, they don't miss anything that I'm talking about at all. It, it is all very relatable. But yeah, they're just and and a really fun group. People that have been following him for a long time. So opening up for Larry, opening up, I open up for Nate Bargatze, Burt Kreischer, all those types of guys. Their their crowd, they're really locked in and ready for some great comedy. I mean. They're already there to see to see one of the best to ever do it. So it's really just an honor to to do that twenty minute spot in front of them. It's a lot of fun. So how's Larry's crowd different than say Bert's crowd? Bert also has these massive crowds, but he seems to get a lot of hate online, like the most hated. But he's still selling. Hated. Yeah, he's still selling stadiums though. So it's like they both have packed out shows. So how does the vibe differ in say a Bert crowd? Well, Bert's crowd is. Uh, it's like you walked into a living room of a house party. Larry's crowd is like you walked into the backyard of a barbecue. <laughs> yeah. And so that's the best way that I can describe. I mean, Bert's, it's a party crowd. You know, speaking of that, I don't understand the hate online with Bert. It's, it's probably just because he's just such a presence online that he draws these insufferable trolls. But, uh, yeah, I mean, he's definitely got a huge fan base. I mean, he's doing these arenas. 15,000 people, 12,000 people. But yeah, the difference between them both would, would definitely be the party crowd to the uh, just got off the bass boat crowd. I think sometimes as fans, it's fun to hate on things. But some people just don't get hate that sticks. You look at like a, a Keanu Reeves or Larry the Cable Guy, it wouldn't affect them. And so you can't hate them because they just aren't hateable. I don't know. It's a little bit of like a guilty no. pleasure to just be a dick. No, it is. I agree. And I also think that Bert accidentally was one of the first people, and he's never said this, and I've never heard. I, this is just an outsider's. I, I think he showed that he paid attention, and he showed that he cared, and he's emotional, and these things. So with trolls and these people that love to, to run their mouth online, you know, you show that you're paying attention. It is literal fuel to the fire. And so Bert started commenting on the comments about his weight and his comedy. And when people went, oh, this guy is reading these. And then Bert's sitting here crying over a conversation over tater tot. It's made him, it, it, he's like an easy target where every other comic that's ever existed, uh, even though we all do take a peek online, you know, you play your cards as if you're just not even, you know, you, you act like you've not seen any of that stuff. And I think Bert hurt himself by going, hey, I see this. And people leaned into it. But, you know, he's the most lovable guy ever. I mean, hanging out with Bert offstage is like Bert on stage. It's the same way he's smoking a cigar. He's telling you, you know, 
uh, about his favorite John Mellencamp song, you know, while he's eating an edible at the same time. So he, he's he's the real deal. Nicest guy ever. Now, you seem like a classic rock fan like Mellencamp, Ted Nugent, Bob Seger, ACDC, Bowie. I found that a little surprising. Just a lot of comedians from the South, they're into country music. But you seem to be a classic rock fan. Is that accurate? No, yeah, that is definitely accurate. I mean, I, I come out every show to... Uh, Stranglehold by Ted Nugent, which I think is one of the greatest guitar rock songs to ever exist. But yeah, man, that I, I jam to a lot of that. And just like most people, man, it, it depends on who you were raised by and what you listened to. And uh, I was raised by uh, some good time Charlie, some folks who like to, to hang out on the back deck and uh, let some Bob Seger loose, you know, some ZZ Top. And I still listen to him. My Spotify is full of that today. I, I, I love love some good classic rock. Have you bumped into any of these icons? I mean, you're doing some pretty big profile shows these days. They have to be hanging around once in a while. Yeah. I mean, speaking of John Mellencamp, I mean, I didn't get to... He was doing the, the same venue as Burt, like a split. This place had like two sides of a, a convention center. And me and Burt, we, uh, we were on the tour bus. We sang like every John Mellencamp song we could think of. We were very hyped to meet him. Bert ended up meeting him separately. I didn't get to meet him, but John's sons, Hudson and another guy, both of his sons ended up hanging out with us all night long. And let me tell you, <laughs> just as a guy that loves John Mellon, that was close enough for me, my man. Some of those cool experiences definitely do happen. Mellencamp, I'd be a little intimidated. Let's go back to the hating speech. I feel like if I told Bert I hated him, he would argue back with me. If I told Larry I hated him, the cable guy, he'd make it a joke somehow and make me laugh. If I told Mellencamp I hated him, I'm pretty sure he'd punch me in the face and kick my ass. No, he would. He would remove the cigarette from his mouth, stare at you for about four seconds, and then probably smoke you. <laughs> I agree. You're, I, I, I saw him from a distance, and he looked like the. I mean, he's got that kind of James Dean kind of just, he's over there with the jean jacket on smoking a cigarette. He looks, he looks like how he should look. Yeah, I love how he's so accurately what you think he is. It's like sometimes the curtain goes down, you're like, oh, that's just a character. And then, but Mellencamp, mm -hmm. you're like, I don't, there's no difference between him at a diner and then him in front of 10,000 people. And I love that no, about Mellencamp. No, I agree. I agree 100%. That, I love that too. So now, Eating sure. Dinner Twice, your album, you talk about getting a couple of DUIs. Is that accurate? Did that really happen? Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, that's essentially how I got into comedy. I got. Two DUIs in six months, about 13, almost 14 years ago. And uh, it took me about that long to get the courage to make a bit out of it. And it's been one of my most viral bits I've ever had. But yeah, that's that's for sure a true a true story. And, you know, there, there's I don't condone drinking and driving. And it's not me, you know, uh, for the people that haven't heard it, it's not me making light of it. But it is me defending a few things since so much has changed with Uber and Lyft and that and, and, and all that so forth. But it's a, it's a fun bit. You know, I'm super excited about my kids getting to drinking age. I just had this conversation with some friends recently. We didn't have Uber. You would end up driving drunk inadvertently all the time. And then it really started to be like the campaigns of like drinking and driving. But like my parents' generation, they were like, yeah, the cops would pull you over or find you passed out. And they'd be like, dump your beer out. I'll follow you home. And now you can get on your phone and get a ride home. They'll never even think about driving drunk. No, no, that's what I mean. It's like, that's why when I, I start off the bit, I'm kind of telling people, hey, I, I've got to defend a few things here. I mean, I got mine when we were still fighting for ourselves, you know, without any Uber or Lyft. These, anybody that's under the age of 30, they don't know what it's like to see their DD blackout. Yeah. Um, it, is a, it is a terrifying situation, you know. So it's been, a, it, it, you know, and then people also, though, after the show, they'll go, what about a taxi? What about a cab? And I've got to remind them, I'm from Alabama. A small I mean, town. They don't I'm have that. Yeah. Cabs are inside a truck. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, it's a different place. Yeah, I'm from a small town too, so that wasn't an option. But I, I remember you said you're DD. I remember looking over and he's got one eye covered. And I'm like, oh no, he's seeing double. This is, yeah. this is not going well for me. And I'm worse off than him. It, that's exactly right. And you know that if you guys, you know, don't get Taco Bell that night, you'll die as a group anyway. <laughs> you know, it, there's different variables. Uh, it was... It was just a different time. I, I, the line I say in the bit is so true. I said, we didn't drive drunk because we wanted to. We wanted to see our family again. You know, it was, it was the only option. There wasn't another, there wasn't another way home 
back in the day. I've got a serious question for you now. What is your go-to crock pot meal? Oh, man. Um, I mean, I have, I have several of them. But, I mean, uh, I would say, like, uh, man, chili. I mean, I, I've got several things. I mean, one of the most country redneck things I'll do is every Christmas I'll put a ham inside of the crock pot, and all you do is add one can of Coca-Cola, and you let that thing run for about 10 hours. Now, don't eat too much at one time. It's a lot of sodium. Your feet will swell up on you. <laughs> yeah, but, you uh, get gout? Uh, yeah, no kidding. I mean, I'm talking about we really. But, uh, yeah, I mean, just one ham and a Coca-Cola in a crock pot is probably the easiest recipe I know, and it is unbelievable. I'm pretty late to the crock pot game, and I didn't realize the differences in sizes. As a kid, I just thought a crock pot was a crock pot. I got one, and then I was like, I can't fit a chicken in this. And then I realized, oh, it's like a refrigerator or a freezer. You can step these suckers up. I got three different sizes, depending on you know what type of party, you know what we're trying to uh, get into. But yeah, that, that that's the great thing about it. You can do a huge one for a bunch of people. Sometimes I'll just do a small one and put some you know some meatballs in there. And add that Heinz chili sauce and then, you know, get some toothpicks rolling. Now you got like an appetizer just, you know, hanging around the kitchen all day long. So, yeah, I'm a, I'm a big, I'm a, you know, that bit that I have about crockpots came from a real place. It, they, they are near and dear to my heart. What about Waffle House? What's your go-to order there? Oh, man, I'm going to go classic. Do you know about Waffle House? Do I do. I, I, lived, there? I lived in Florida for a while. It was quite popular down there. And then I've got family in North Carolina. So. We drive to Florida every year, so we go down to the Carolinas, Georgia, and then that's when I would start seeing like Wawa and Popeye's Chicken. They're more spread out now, but back in the 90s and the 80s, that was the only place to get Popeye's Chicken and Waffle House. They didn't exist outside of that southern strip, I mean, if my memory is accurate. So yeah, I'm, no, I'm, a, right. I'm a classic no. breakfast guy myself. Yeah, me too, man. I'm, I'm a diner guy from way back. But yeah, Waffle House is my favorite. I've got a framed picture of Waffle House in my dining room. <laughs> Wait, what? And it is, yeah, man. I mean, I'm. It's right here behind me right now. It's <laughs> a beautiful picture of a Waffle House in Fort Walton Beach. It, Waffle House is a special place. I, I grew up eating there my whole life. I mean, we used it for everything. We'd go there after baptisms and when we were blackout. It did the whole cycle for us. <laughs> yeah, it is and, like and, the yeah. It's the catch all for everything going on in your life. It is. You can go there at two a.m. We can go there at 9 a.m. and two different vibes. You go there at 9 a.m., we get a newspaper rolling. We'll have some hot coffee, you know, a, a controlled environment. At 2 a.m., you know, you might see, uh, you know, the first 48 might be shooting an episode <laughs> in there. Um, you know, it can change. It can change quick. But, you know, the Waffle Houses in Colorado, I tell people, are terrible compared to where I'm from. I mean, there's two of them in this state. Uh, I live in Colorado now, and, I mean, they're, they're just not the same. They're like rehab centers with hash browns. They're just different. <laughs> well, it's Derek Stroop. He's got the debut album, Eating Dinner Twice, out now. You can get it on Spotify and other streaming services. It's Derek Yells on Instagram. Derek, congratulations on the album, man, and thanks for the talk today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it, and, and uh, have a good afternoon. Thank you so much.